Masechet Kiddushin, Daf Chet. Nowadays, if someone does Kiddushin with a ring, we ask them to get a plain uh, ring um, so that its value is uh, more or less well known. If you use a fancy ring with diamonds, and you never know, people aren't experts in diamonds. Is this worth $500, $5,000, $50,000? You never know. Um, and then that could be a problem because then the uh, uh, bride might think it's 5000 and so she's committing herself. Turns out it's only five. She says, oh, I wouldn't have committed myself just for 500 And therefore, if you use a coin, then it's self-evident it says on the coin how much it is. And if you use a ring, and if it's a plain ring, then there's a smaller range of what it could be. And so that's uh, a lot better. Um, so the following sukya is related to this subject. There was a certain guy, and he gave his bride a piece of silk. With this piece of silk. Rabba Amar la Serichi Shuma. Rabbi Yosef Amar Serichi Shuma. We have a machloket. Rabba says, you don't have to assess its value. It's certainly worth more than a peruta. It's a nice piece of silk. So it passes the minimum value. He gave it. She accepted it. Shalom al Yisrael. Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef, however, says, no, you have to go get an expert to give it a value, and uh, then you'll know the value. She'll know. He'll know. This thing is worth uh, $50. Good. Why? No, okay, that's the machloket. Now, let's try to figure out uh, what, in what case are they actually arguing? If he told her, with any value of this silk, right, even a minimal value, just one piruta of this silk garment is for the kiddushin, the rest of it is just a gift, then everyone would agree that you don't need to assess it because it's certainly worth more than the piruta, so it doesn't matter if it's worth 550 or 500. So that's not the machloket. We're going to come, we're going to backtrack on this in a second. But this is all the first version. If the guy said, here, to me, with this piece of silk that's worth 50 dinar, and it turns out it's only worth 40 dinar, then that's certainly invalid. Also, everyone would agree that that's no good because she that's under for, under false pre- pretenses her agreement rather the case of the machloket is limited to where he said here this is a silk a piece of silk for you it's worth 50 and it was in fact worth 50 here's the two sides what's the problem he said it's 50 Turns out it is 50, so if they, if they assess it later, so there's no need to assess it before. Rav Yosef Amar Serichi Shumas, even in that case, you have to assess it, otherwise it's invalid. Because the wife is not an expert in appraising silk, there's different prices for this, so she's not going to rely on his statement that it's worth 50. She didn't think, back of her mind, she said, oh, he's probably exaggerating, it's not really worth 50. If it were, were worth 50, yeah, maybe I would, but it's probably not worth 50, so she's not committing herself. So because she doesn't really know and doesn't trust that it's really worth 50, so she's not doing, she's not going to commit herself. On the other hand, if you get an expert that comes and says, this is worth 50, then she'll believe it. And she'll say, okay, fine, now I, I accept the Kiddushin. Um, so that's why you have to get a, an expert uh, assessment. All right, all that's one version of our understanding of this uh, machloket. Second version, they are also arguing not only when it's uh, worth something, even if it's, uh, uh, sorry, not only when uh, he, he says it's 50 and it's worth 50, even if he says, um, with any amount, with a piruta of this garment, and the rest is just a gift, even there, the machloket applies. Rav Yosef, uh, so if it's only that, so it would be clear why Rabba says you don't need Shuma, because he said it's just a kol dehu, so we don't have to explain Rabba. But why would Rav Yosef say that we need an assessment if he's only, if he says explicitly, just with any value? Shave kesef, arehu ke kesef. Ma kesef te kiitz, af shave kesef nami te kiitz. Uh, because uh, the uh, money is the same as something that's uh, that's uh, worth money, uh, meaning a currency um, has the same law as uh, something anything of value. Uh, in in what sense are they similar? Just like currency has a set value. You look on the coin, one dollar coin, five dollar coin says so. 
I don't know if there is a five dollar coin. Uh, a quarter. All right. So it says what it is on it. So too, if you want to do kiddushin with something that's worth money, fine, you can, but it has to be a clearly defined amount. You have to be it has to have the price tag on it. You need an expert to come and tell you this this cloth is worth fifty dollars. Even if you say I'm only using a kol dehu of it, just a peduta. Nevertheless, it has to be similar to currency. That's Rav Yosef's position. Now, how does Rav Yosef know this? We're going to bring two proofs. Here's the first one. Amar Rav Yosef, mina amin Allah. How do I know that something that's worth money has to have a fixed value like currency? The Braita is quoting the following pasuk. From Vaikra. It's talking about if an if a Jew is sold to a non Jew as a slave, and now it's a mitzvah, you should try to redeem that Jew. Um, if you uh, uh, when you come to redeem him, you have to calculate the number of years from now until the Jubilee and uh, com- uh, uh, subtract proportionally with the number of years left. And Pasuk says, Im od, od rabot bashanim lefihen yashib geulato mikesef miknato. If there's many years, then you, and you want to redeem your family, you have to pay back for the redemption in proportion to the purchase price. So we're going to analyze these two phrases, yashib geulato and mikesef miknato. It does mention money here. So this, Braita says, mikesef miknato teaches us that you have to redeem him with money, with currency, and you cannot use other items like grain or vessels. No, that's the Braita. Now Rav Yosef says, let's analyze this Braita. What would be a case where you might think that you could use Tibwa and Kelim? If, you, if it means that you can't use um, grain and vessels at all, that can't be because the Braita also teaches that the other phrase, Yashib Gyulata, is, is, is expanding and says you can use not only currency, but an equivalent, something that is worth, anything that's worth money, you can use. So now we have this, in this Braita, an expansive and a restrictive, it says, Mikesa Mignato, not uh, not uh, grain and vessels, but you can use some things that are not currency. So how is it going to work? If it's talking about a case where you're using something that's not even worth a peruta, let's say shave kesef, but it's worth less than a peruta, then afilu kesef name. Then even money, you can't you can't redeem a slave with money that's worth less than a peruta. Doesn't work. So it can't be talking about that case. El alav de it behu shave peruta. So rather, it's talking about a case where there, it is worth a peruta. Bechavan de la kaisi la. So what's wrong with the vessels and uh, uh, grain and vessels? It's talking about a case where um, it doesn't have. It was not given a set value. That's the problem. So in other words, we're uh, including not just actual currency, but anything that is like currency that has a set value, that's good. That's what we learned from Yashib Geulato. From the other, Mikhesa Miknato teaches that you can't use just a pile of grain and or vessels that are not given a set value. So that's Rav Yosef's proof. Okay, seems like a nice proof. Ve'idach Raba, who said you don't have to assess what, how, how, would, how will he uh, deal with that pasuk? What is it teaching us? So he understands it as follows, that you can use money, um, and you can use anything that's equivalent of money. You can even use uh, uh, grain and, um, and vessels. As long as you're using it as money, meaning you're acquiring it with the value of the money, like you would a purchase, um, that's fine. But you can't use grain and vessels in, in, as an exchange, right? If you're using the tivuan kilim, not for its monetary value, but rather for its symbolic value, that would be a kinyan chalipin. Kinyan chalipin can be done with uh, uh, even something that's worth less than a peruta. Uh, generally, it's also called kinyan sudar. So use a handkerchief. 
Um, so, but that is a symbolic exchange because it's not about the value of the item, but rather here, you're taking something and by taking something, you're giving something. So when you're going to redeem a slave, you have to give the value of the slave according to the years. Therefore, has to be something of actual value, money or an equivalent of money, and not using a vessel or grain in, a, in an exchange, a chalipin. That's, what Rabbah, that's how Rabbah will explain this pasuk. Okay, so that's good so far. However, there is an opinion about chalipin, about what actually you can use. Certainly you can use a vessel, like a, a, a cup, or a handkerchief is a vessel. So certainly you can use something like that. But Rav Nachman says you have to use things like that and not produce. You cannot use produce. And of course, so according to that, grain, you cannot use for chalipin anyway. So we wouldn't need this pasuk to tell me that you can't use uh, chalipin because it says tebu'ah. If it says tebu'ah, certainly it's the monetary value because chalipin is in- impossible anyway. Therefore, we go back to the question, Rabbah, what are you going to do with this pasuk? Or rather, Rabbah can explain that this pasuk is talking about a case where it's less than the peduta, this item that you're going to use to uh, acquire the slave. Not to acquire, to redeem the slave. And we rejected that earlier because we said, why would it bother telling me that tivwa and kelim, that's less than a peduta, you can't use? Even money that's less than a peduta, you can't use because you can't acquire anything with money that's less than the peduta. But it's still teaching us that, what, th- this, as in the form of Lami Bayat, saying something that uh, that's more obvious, and then somebody saying something that's even less obvious. Or rather, it's not saying something that's more obvious, but rather giving us a chidush by, say, by telling us to one kelim, even though it would be the same for kesef. What's the extra chidush? Lami Bayat kesef di'it be'shave peduta in ila la. I'm not even going to tell you, I don't need to state, that you can't use kesef that's less than a peduta. You don't even have a you don't even have a currency that's less than a peduta. peduta is the smallest currency, but somehow you maybe uh, you share a peduta with someone else, and so you, you have my half share of this peduta. That for sure, for, for sure, I don't even have to state that if it has a peduta, then you can use it for money. If not, then you can't use it for money, and you can't use it to redeem. That's obvious. But you might have thought that if it's an item Item, like grain, let's say uh, popcorn. That's grain, right? I have a handful of popcorn. How much is that worth? Uh, one cent. Um, so a person would say, one cent. I don't want one cent. It's not. You can't buy anything with that. But a handful of popcorn, because you can, it, the you can benefit from it right away. So you might have thought that for something that you can use and benefit right away. Even though it's less than a peduta, maybe you can effectuate a transaction with an item um, because it's better than money. You can you can appreciate it. You can use it, um, and so the, the master who owns the slave would say, "Yeah, okay, fine. I'll I'll give over the slave." So that's why it teach, the pasuk has to teach. No, it only works with something that's money that's worth something, and not grain or uh, uh, or vessels that are worth less than a peduta. So we have an alternate, a Rabbah can answer as an alternate explanation for that pasuk. Okay, good. All that is one proof that Rav Yosef brought, and now he's going to bring, bring a second proof. Again, we're trying to prove that something um, that you're using as Shaveh Kesef has to be like Kesef, and just like Kesef has a fixed amount, so too um, uh, any item that you're using uh, for its value, you have to assess with an expert first, and so it has a fixed amount. That, and that's why if you're using Kiddushin, if you're using silk uh, cloth, cloth, or whatever you're using for Kiddushin, you have to get an expert assessment. So uh, that's, uh, we saw one proof, here's the second. Amad of Yosef. Uh, so if someone has to do pidyon haben, the father has to give five shekalim to the kohen. Now, usually today we actually get five coins and he gives them five coins. But what if you don't do that? And instead you say, here's a calf 
I'm giving you this calf, the Kohen, uh, for the redemption of my son. Or I'm giving you this cloth, this cloth for the redemption of my son. No good, because you have to give five shekalim. However, if you say, this calf, uh, th I'm giving you this calf, which is a value of five selaim for the redemption. Or this cloak for its value of, that is worth five selaim, for my pigeon, then that is okay because now you specified the exact amount. Um, now, hi pigeon hechidame. Let's clarify. What are the circumstances in which this baraita is talking? Ilema de la shave kol kemine. Let's say if it, let's say this uh, piece of cloth cloth is actually not worth five selaim. So is it in its power to say, oh, I, I, I declare it to be five selaim? No, obviously not. Rather, it must be that it is worth five selaim. So what's the problem in the resha? Because he didn't give it a set value. He just said, here, take this cloak. Who knows how much this cloak is worth? It's no good. If you want to use money, you can use money. That's what we like to do. That's the best. If you want to use a value of money, that's okay too. But you have to get an assessment and then you can come and say, here is this cloak that is worth five salaim. That's okay. So here's a second proof that whenever you're using Shaveh Kesef for a payment, it has to be something that has, that has a fixed value that you assess. All right, this seems like a good proof, but then we reject it. No, maybe we'll go back to the original uh, 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 proposition that it's actually not worth five salaim. Um, but the Kohen accepts it upon, for, for himself with the value for him it's worth sometimes values are subjective could be a thing that generally is general is worth only for selaim but for this go ahead i really particularly like this cloak i would pay five for example rav kahana he always liked to cover his head with a turban and so um he himself he was a kohen rav kahana means kohen and he uh, uh, accepted a, a, a kerchief for Pijon Haben, and he said, for me, its worth, its value is worth five selaim, right? It's worth it to him. Look, after all, in uh, Pijon Haben today, we take a sela coin that's worth uh, maybe $20, and we and we auction it off. Uh, sometimes it goes for 1000 or $2,000. It's worth it to that person who bought it who wants to uh, do a, another mitzvah with it. So uh, value is subjective. If it's, if it's worth five selaim to that particular person, then Kohen, then it's acceptable. Um, uh, uh, Ashe said, yeah, I only said this, um, this, this, this uh, uh, possibility is only true for someone like Rav Kahana, who is an important person, and he needs a turban on his head all the time. So for him, he would say, oh, that's a good one. I want to use that silk uh, piece of cloth, uh, and it's worth more to me. But for a regular person, they're not, they wouldn't buy, they wouldn't pay extra for it. So a regular person, uh, with this form of payment would not work. For example, a story about uh, Mor Barav Ashe bought a cloth from Rabba's mother um, from a place called Kove for 13 dinar, even though it was worth 10, because he really wanted it. He was an important person, and this would look good on him. So that in that case, yes. According to this explanation of the Braita, the Resha is where he gives um, a, a piece of cloth worth only four dinar to the Kohen and says without saying anything so that's certainly not acceptable um, but if he takes a, a piece of cloth that on the market is worth four but to this Kohen it's worth five and he says here is uh, here is a cloth right uh, that will you accept it for a value of five and the Kohen says yes if, for, for, to me it's worth five salaim then it's acceptable uh, but there's no proof from here that payment 
with an equivalent of money has to have an assessment. All right, this is just, you only need to say it's five salaim here because it's actually not worth five salaim on the general market. If it is, if it is worth uh, five salaim or more, then you don't need to say anything and you do not need to get an assessment. And so that's a rejection of Rav Yosef's proof. All right, next case. Amar Rabbi El Azar, hit kadeshili bemane, benatan la dinar, harezo me kodeshet ve yashlim. Rabbi El Azar says, if a man says to a woman, be me uh, to me with 100 dinar. But right now he only gives a down payment of one dinar. Um, uh, that works. So she is mikudeshet, but he has to pay the rest later. Um, if, assuming he does, then there will be mikudashim um, from now. But if he doesn't pay ever, then that will be a problem. Retroactively, she will not be mikudeshet. So my tama, why is this good? Because since he said um, you are mikudeshet with 100 and he gives one, it's as if he's saying, on condition that I pay the rest at some point. Then if he pays the rest, retroactively, um, it works, as conditions generally work retro- retroactively. Right, here we say that. Even if you don't say from now, anytime you make a condition, we assume you mean from now. You're mikudeshet from now, assuming that the condition will be fulfilled at some point. So it's okay to give a down payment now and pay the rest later. If you pay the rest at some point, then retroactively the Kiddushin is good. Now, pro- challenge to Rabbi El Azar. Metibe. Hit kadashili be mane, vayamone veholech verase had mehen lachzor, a filu bedinada haron, hadeshut be yadom. A husband, a man says to a, uh, a bride, um, be mikudeshet to me with 100 dinar, and he's counting it out. He wants to make sure he's accurate. He's saying one, two, three, right? Putting them all in her, in, putting each dinar into her hand. And then, let's say he changes his mind and says, you know what? Uh, he's at number uh, 60. This is not a lot of money. I don't know if you're worth it. Oh, you know, I changed my mind. He can change his mind. She also can change her mind, right? Until, until it gets to 99, he's about to do the 100. She says, uh, you know what? I changed my mind. Forget it. I'm out. Um, uh, that is that they they each uh, either party can um, renege on the deal before the last one is paid. Now, what you see here is um, this is a contradiction because it means that from the we just the Biel as I just said, well, as, uh, as soon as he gives the first dinar, the kiddushin is already in. That's it. You can't change your mind as long as he eventually gives her the rest of the ninety nine. Then it, uh, she is mikudeshet. She can't renege on the deal afterwards. Um, I mean, he can. He can because he could just not pay, and uh, then they will not have been mik, uh, uh, um, uh, engaged. Um, but if uh, if once she agrees to the first one, that's it. They are engaged if he pays the rest. Whereas here, before the night, before the hundredth one, she can say, "You know what? I'm out." So how can we resolve this contradiction? So we answer this paraita hachab ma'iskinan damar bemane zo. This this paraita, even though it says hitkachi li bemane, what's we're going to add in a word? Um, you be mikudesha to me with this hundred dinar here that I have in my hand. He shows her. So if you say this hundred dinar, then he has to give her all of it because he said this. If you don't say this, he just says a hundred dinar. Then we can translate that as a condition. Here's one as a down payment. You have to give something. Um, but the rest he can pay later. Okay, this seems like a good answer. Here's the problem: we only we only we only got the first half of the brayta. There's a second half of the brayta that actually says zo hamidesefa bemane zo resha bemane stam. And if the sefa is a case of zo, then the resha can't also be a case of zo. You're gonna have the two clauses that have the exact same case. Here's the sefa. The Sefa says, if the man says, be my wife with this 100 uh, dinar, and turns out that it's only 99, no good. Or one of them, instead of silver, is a copper uh, coin. No good. It's not a hundred. Um, if, however, it's, it is a silver dinar, but it's debased. 
and, uh, 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 coins could get worn out just from the natural use, or sometimes people would chip away a little bit on the coin of the edge, and they could get some sh- silver sh- shavings, and it's still worth it's still worth the same amount because it says on it it's worth a dinar, until eventually more and more people keep shaving away, and then it's only a, a, you know smaller than it is, and at some point people will say, you know what, I'm not accepting that. That's why in a lot of coins like quarters t- t- today are ridges all along the edge. That way, if somebody shaves it off, they'll say, oh, this is all shaved off. It's not, not, not the right size. Okay, so if it's a bad coin, then it still is, it still is she is Mikudeshit because he did give her the coin, but he has to give her a better one because it's, you're not going to be able to use that bad coin in the marketplace. That's the Sefa. So since the Sefa is a case of Zoh, that means that Esha is not a case of Zoh. And now we have our question again against Rabbi El Azar. Rabbi El Azar says, as soon as you give the first, she is Mikudesh, she can't change her mind. And the, the, the beginning of the Brayta says, that she can change her mind until the last one. So we say, In fact, I can explain the whole Braita. Resha and Sefa are talking about the same case indeed when he says this hundred. And the Sefa is explaining the Resha. The Resha says, if um, uh, uh, someone, if he says mane, uh, um, then he, anyone can be uh, manezo. Then anybody can change their mind, even up to the last one. How so? What is the exact case when he says be manezo? It's a bit of a difficult explanation because why not say may why not say the word zo? But nevertheless, the Gemara is going to double down on this interpretation and says It actually makes sense that it should be this interpretation. Um, if you would say that the Resha is talking about it when he says here is just Mikudesh uh, um, with 100 and doesn't say Zo and the Braita informs of informs us that the Kiddushin is, is not a, is not does not uh, take into, take effect until he pays the last one so if that's true when he says Stam then all the more so you wouldn't have to tell me that when he says Mane Zo that it's also no good unless he pays all hundred, right? Manezo is a much more um, uh, obvious case. You wouldn't have to say it at all. So it doesn't make sense for the de, for the baraita to say a less obvious case and then a more obvious case. Rather, um, it makes sense as we said here that it's all talking about the same case, manezo. And since this baraita is talking about manezo, it's different than the case of Rabbi Al Azar. He he was talking about mane stam. Well, if you say mane stam, we treat it as a condition, and then once you pay one. One, the Kiddushin goes through. If you say Manezo, and this whole Brayta is about Manezo, then it does not go into effect until you pay the last one. Good. So that's a good answer for Rabbi Al-Azhar. We say, this is, listen, this is not necessarily the only way to interpret the Brayta. If it's because of this consideration here of the structure of the Brayta, this would not it's, not, it's not a proof that you have to read the Brayta this way. Because Tana Sefa Legalu Yeresha, Sheloto Maresha Bemanezo, Ava Bemane Setam, Havuki Dushin, Tana Sefa Bemanezo, Mikla Deresha Bemane Setam, Vafilohi La Havuki Dushin. It could be that the Sefa is there to teach me how to read the Resha. Because if you only taught one case, the Resha as as is, I would say, oh, the Resha says Bemane is means Manezo. That's what we're talking about. But if it was Mane Stam, then it would be Kiddushin, like Rabbi El Azar, like as Rabbi El Azar says. That's why the Braita has to say in the Sefa, Manezo, so that I, I see the contrast. And I'll know that the Resha is not Manezo, but Mane Stam. And even though he just said Bemane, and he didn't say Zoh, nevertheless, the Kiddushin is not effectuated until the la- very last one. And so you actually could read the Braita against Rabbi El Azad. It's a valid reading. You don't have to read it the way we just did, although you could also read it in the way we just did, um, in a, uh, in such that it would not contradict Rabbi El Azad. The Braita can, it can be read in both ways. Good. Rav Asher Amar, Mone Veholech Shane, Dedata Akule. Rav Asher said, You know what? I 
can reconcile the plain reading of the Braita, this last reading, that is talking about two different cases. Mane, it means only Mane, without Zoh. Sefa is with Zoh. And I can reconcile that with Rabbi al in an easier way by explaining that if you're going and counting along, that's different than if you just say the a formula and only give one. Rabbi al said, if I just, uh, if I say, um, are you a me kodesh with a hundred dinar? Here's one, right? Down payment, on condition that I pay the rest later. I'm only giving you one. Fine, that's acceptable. That's different than from the Braita, where I say the same formula, but then I'm counting it out. One, two, three, four. Because in that case, right, the, her mind is on receiving all of them. She sees all of them right there. He's in the process of, of giving them all over. So she's waiting to agree to um, finalize her agreement until she gets the last one. Until she gets the last one, she has not accepted it because she's in the middle of counting. And uh, therefore, that's a, a smoother way of reconciling the Braita with Rabbi El Azar. All right, good. Now, since we mentioned the Braita, a couple of other things, we have to explain them. What do you mean a copper coin? If she saw it, right? After all, he's, she, you know, he's giving her this money. Wouldn't she notice that there's a copper coin? Coin, if she accepted it anyway, so fine. She knew and she accepted it. She, you know, if it's up to her, so then it should be a valid kiddushin. Uh, rather, we're talking. We must be talking about a case where it was night and it was dark and she couldn't see, or was found among. It was a pile of coins. He said, right, with this hundred dinar, and he gives her a pile. And then uh, turns out late, and she accepts it. Turns out later, she's looking through it, and underneath there was not all, there were all silver except for one was copper. So then she, she didn't accept it on that basis. She assumed that they're all silver proper coins, and so this is mekach ta'ut. Good. Last case, Haidi ra hechidame. It said if it's a, if it's a bad coin. And then the Kiddushin goes through, but she has to replace it with a better one. Now, what's the case? If it's a coin that's so debased that it can't be used in the marketplace, so then that's the same as a copper coin. It's not worth a dinar. We're talking about a case where it, it can be used, but with difficulty. Most stores won't accept it, but you can go to some store down the, down the block and they'll say, all right, fine, they'll accept it. You might have to try a few times. Uh, it's like if you have you know, a bad dollar that's ripped and taped up, you're going to go to a few stores, they're going to say, I'm not accepting this dollar bill, but you can always find a store that will accept it. So therefore, she accepted it as fine, but still he said dinar, and so she deserves a full dinar, and therefore he is required to replace it. Now a new case. Amarava, Amarav Nachman, Amar lahit kadeshili bemane veiniach la mashkon aleha ena mekudeshet. A groom says to a bride, man says to a woman, um, be mekudeshet to me with a hundred dinar. I listen, I don't have any money now, but take uh, my watch as a as collateral. Uh, hold on to it, and then uh, you know tomorrow, at some point, I'll give you the hundred dinar, and you'll give me the watch back. There is no kiddushin here. Why? Mane en kan, mashkon en kan. There's no money. He didn't give her any money. And the mashkon that he gave her doesn't belong to her. He's, she's going to have to return it. So he didn't give her anything uh, at this point. You have to give something. Even if you say a down payment, give, give her a one, one dinar and the rest uh, will come later, that's fine. But here, she has no ownership. There is no dinar at all. And she doesn't have ownership over the watch. So it's nothing. Rava said the original law in the name of Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman taught Rava this halacha. And now Rava is challenging Rav Nachman from the following beraita. That says, Kiddusha b'mashkon mekudeshet. If a man gives a woman a mashkon, here I'm going to pay you later, mekudeshet li with a hundred azuz, and here's a watch uh, to hold on to as collateral. The Kiddushin is good. So what's going on? Why do you say it's not a Kiddushin if this beraita says it is good? Hatam b'mashkon. So we can answer that this case of the Braita is talking about, let's say the husband has a mashkon 
that he that from someone else right let's say i'm going to do kiddushin with a woman and it happens to be some guy other guy reuven he owes me money and he gave me his watch as collateral to hold on to and now i take this collateral and i give it to a woman and say with this collateral that i'm holding on behalf of a different loan i'm transferring it to you right and then if he pays back he'll pay you back if he doesn't pay pay anyone and then he then you can keep the watch so that works as according to the uh, directive of Rabbi Yitzchak, the Rabbi Yitzchak, how do we know that uh, a creditor actually acquires the collateral? He's holding on to it, and it's actually his for that time. We're learning from the Pasuk and Devarim about collateral. If I'm holding a, a collateral, let's say someone's blanket, and uh, they have nothing else to sleep with. So the Torah says, give him back his blanket at night so he can sleep with it, and then he'll return it in the morning. It kind of loses the purpose of collateral because he's using it whenever he needs it. Nevertheless, this will be a sedaka. This is an act of righteousness that you're helping him out. The collateral will be that he has he's reminded every day he has to come and bring you the blanket. So that's going to be somewhat of a of a hold on him to pay back. But it's not nice to hold his his uh, bed sheets, his blanket, so he's going to be cold at night. Rather do a sedaka. Now, why why do you call it a sedaka? If I don't, if I, if it's not mine, what well, then? Uh, I'm just I'm not actually giving him something that isn't already his. So that would we wouldn't call sedaka if I'm just if I'm simply giving him something that's already his. It's only sedaka if it, when he gives me the collateral, it's mine. I I acquire ownership of it. So the Torah says. Give an act of charity and give it to him each night. So that's uh, the proof that uh, there is ownership. So that's different from, in, in the case of that's actually collateral on a loan. So the collateral on a loan, yes, I, I own. With this uh, this case um, that Rava mentioned, but there was not a loan. Or she didn't give me anything that I'm returning to her. I'm, I have to pay her something. And if I just give her a collateral for something that I will pay, but it's actually not actually a loan, then there, there is no acquisition of anything. But for this, this uh, thing from the third party that is a loan, that that collateral on the loan is something that I own and therefore I can give to her and she is mikudeshit. All right, that's one view. We're going to see here now a contrasting view. Bene Rav Kaha Rav Huna Bar Avin. Zebuna Hi Amta Bifrite. The sons of Rav Huna Bar Avin, they bought a maidservant and the amount that they agreed to was a few pirutot of copper. Lahavu Be'adaihu. But they didn't have uh, change around. They didn't have it. Oti Bi Nasnascha Aleha. So instead, they gave a piece of silver. Um, as collateral, right? Uh, so, uh, whatever that was worth, we right, hold on to this, and we're going to get the copper coins later. The sof amta. By time they, uh, by time they came back, the price of the maidservant increased. Maybe she learned a new skill, and now her price went up. Uh, so the um, the seller wants to renege on the deal because now he can get more money for her. So atu lekamed rabbi ameh the es rabbi ameh whether that's allowed amar lehu perite en kan nascha en kan and he said listen you didn't pay the copper perutot that you promised yet so since you didn't pay that. There is no pay purchase. Um, and also, the uh, silver is not here either because you only gave that to them as collateral for the future payment. And since it's only collateral, collateral is not, trans does not, is not transferred, is not owned. And so you actually gave them nothing. Since you gave them nothing, the you gave the seller nothing, the transaction did not go through, and now the seller can renege on the deal and go get a higher price for the ama. Um, this is not necessarily in contradiction to what came before because this is not actually a loan. This is a purchase. Um, right, he's saying here, you know, uh, I'll uh, I'll pay you that. Hold on to this later as a guarantee that I'll pay you the uh, amount at some other point. So it could be that a loan only if if there's a loan where there already was a transfer of money, 
that I gave that guy the Uven money, he gave me collateral, so now I gave him something, he gave me something, I own this uh, item until he decides to come back and pay it, then I'll give it back to him. But in the case of Kiddushin and in the case of a sale, I'm promising the wife or I'm promising the seller, I'm going to give you this amount of money, but hold on to this in the meantime. So in those cases, the collateral is not owned and therefore the Kiddushin is not effective and the sale is not effective. Next, tenor banan hit kadeshili be mane netalatu uzrakatu la yam o la ur o le chodavar haaved ena mikudeshet. A very important principle in every wedding: the man gives the bride. Uh, let's say a coin, she has to take it in her hands, she's supposed to close her hands and show she's accepting it, right? She doesn't have to say anything, she doesn't have to say I do or anything, but she has to accept the, accept the coin. Um, let's say it falls, you know, it just drops out of her hand, or she, she throws it away, right? He gives her a coin and she says, I don't want this, and she throws it away. There's no kiddushin, right? That shows that she does, is not acceptable to her. Okay, so now um, some variations on that case. If uh, he gives her the coin, she takes the coin and immediately throws it into the sea, throws it into the fire, throws it you know, down off a cliff, any place that it will be destroyed. The Kiddushin is no good, right? Uh, so that's the Braita. Now we're going to analyze the Braita. Wait, uh, you, you're giving me these cases. Is this to mean to imply that, let's say she takes the coin and she throws it back in front of him, right? She throws it back to him. And then it would be Kiddushin? Like, why are you only telling me these cases where it gets destroyed? What about a simpler case that she throws it back to them, uh, back to him? Ha le shekel la ba'ina. Certainly, by throwing it back to him, that's in effect saying, take it. I don't want, uh, I don't want it. I don't want you. So, uh, that case should also be included. So, the answer is, lami bayakama. The, the, the baraita is giving us an even bigger chidush. Obviously, I don't have to say that if she takes the coin and throws it back at him, she's saying, no, I don't want it. Right, that's obvious. But I might have thought that if she takes the coin and throws it into the sea or into the fire, now, if she, if she would throw it to the fire and she means not to accept the Kiddushin, she's going to be liable to pay him back that dinar, right? She, she got it from him. She's saying no to the Kiddushin. So then she has to give it back. It's not hers. So if she, why would she throw it into the fire if she's going to have to now come up with no more money to pay him back? P- people aren't going to do that. They're not that angry, for, you know, to, to reject the proposal. Uh, rather, it must be that since she doesn't have to pay it back, um, uh, since she threw it away, it means that she's not intending to pay it back because she accepted the Kiddushin. Now, if she accepted the Kiddushin, why is she throwing it into the ocean? It's a test. She wants to see if she, her future husband, who she is now committed to, um, uh, let's see if he is, uh, has an angry temperament or not. He wants to see her, he, she wants to see his reaction when she throws it out. Is he going to say, hey, how dare you do that? Right, you know how much I worked for that, blah, blah, blah. Then she's going to say, oh, I'm dealing with the angry person. Now, really, she should have done this test before she accepted the Kiddushin, but anyway, she wants to know how to deal with him going forward. So um, I might have thought that it would be a good Kiddushin, and that's why she's doing it. That's what the Baraita says. Even here, no, the Kiddushin is no good. Certainly, if she throws it back at him, where she is now, she's now she has no liability because she's giving it back to him. Certainly, there that's saying no, and there's no Kiddushin. Even in the case where she throws into the fire where now she's going to have to come up with another dinar to pay him. That also is not a kiddushin. That's an act of saying no. And she's the throwing into the fire, I guess, is very saying a very emphatic no, right? No, not in a million years. Although not in a million years means maybe there's a chance. Okay, so she throws it into the fire. Next case, tenora banan, hit kadeshili bemane, tenem le aba ul avicha ena mikudeshet. A man says, here, be my wife here for this mane. And she says, Give it to 
my father. Give it to your father. There's no kiddushin here because we assume she's being sarcastic. She's saying, uh, you know, keep it. Give it to your father. Forget it. I don't want it. Or even give it to my father. She's just saying, you know, give it to someone else. No good. But if she says, Al kabelum li mikudeshet, if she says, on condition, I will agree to the marriage, on condition that you give it to my father or to your father. So if you say, if she says on condition, that sounds like, like it's sincere. On condition, yeah, I want to give it as a gift to my father or to your father. I really like him. Uh, that's fine. Um, uh, so that, that works. But the first one sounds like it's sarcastic, right? Eh, give it to someone else. Now, um, we analyze this b'raita. Tana aba lehodiyacha koach teresha. Tana avicha lehodiyacha koach tesefa. How come it says both aba and avicha? It says the the uh, word aba, meaning her father, to show me the strength of the resha. That even though she said, give it to my father, in which case it's going to her family. So I might have thought that that means she's serious about it. No, because she says it in that way, we assume that she's being sarcastic. And we say avicha, your father, to show me the strength of the sefa because she says on condition even though she says on condition of giving it to your father her father-in-law uh, which i might think well that's not going to her family it's, uh, so it's not really going to her it's less likely that she would give a gift to her father-in-law we say no but if she said almanat then that means she's serious and uh, she likes her husband she probably likes her father-in-law so she wants to give it as a gift that's okay um okay so these cases work uh, again these cases are different from the one that we said yesterday where um, she initiates and says, right, uh, I will be Mikudesh to you if you give um, something to uh, my friend or another person. Though that, that case works because that, she, she came up with the idea uh, in the first place. Whereas here, he's saying, here is Mane, and she says, give it to Abba. Then we have to analyze if she's sarcastic or not. Now, um, next case, he says, be mikudeshet to me with a mane, and she says, give it to, not fa- not one of the fathers, but give it to so-and-so, no good, not a kiddushin, because we assume here also, she's saying, no, give it to someone else, maybe her uh, her friend, right, don't give it to me, give it to uh, Rivka, right, go, go marry her. I'm, I'm saying no. But if she says, Amenachi Kabelemli, Mikudeshet, if she's on condition that she accepts it on my behalf, then that's okay. That is possible. Now, Usricha, I need uh, both of these cases of, of the father and of a friend, even though they're the same halacha in both. If you only told me that this is the law regarding a father, that in that case, when she says on condition they accept it from me, it's good kiddushin because she relies on them and they say, I, I know that they will do my bidding and they will take this money um, and hold on to it for me. And so that's fine. But if you give it to some other person, just a you know random person or a friend, then maybe they will not go and out of their way and go and uh, do the take the kiddushin on my behalf. So I might think it wouldn't work. So that's why I need this this case to teach me that even with a, with another person not related, it works. If I only had the case of a friend, then I would say that the first clause of give it to that person is not kiddushin because that person is not related to her um, and so she would not want to just give it as a random gift to a random person and that's why it's not kiddushin she so therefore she means ah give it to someone else i don't want it but regarding her father or future father-in-law where she is close to them she is related to them and she would maybe she would want to give a gift i might have thought when she says give it to that give it to my father that she's serious about it and that's why i need that case to say no when she says give it to my father your father anyone it's uh we assume she's being sarcastic if she says on condition then in all cases it's valid and the the man says be mikodeshet to me with this hundred dinar she says put it on the rock 
not good, right? It's, that, that doesn't go to her. If she owns the rock, then that's fine. It puts it on her property. That's okay. But a random rock, no good. What if they share a rock? They have, they have a joint ownership, a partnership, and she says, put it there. Then what's the answer? It, does she mean by it, put it on our rock that I also own? So yes, I'm accepting it. Or because if she, only, if she only owns half and the other, he owns the other half, she's, she is in fact saying, put it on our rock that you have half, meaning keep it. I don't want the, I, I reject the Kiddushin. Take all, we don't know the answer. He says, here, be Mikudeshit to me with this loaf of bread. She says, give it to the dog. That's, that's uh, de- degrading. That's a way of saying, no, I don't want it. Go feed it to, go feed it to a dog. Uh, but if she owns the dog, that's her pet, then it says, oh, feed it to my dog. That's fine. I'm not hungry right now, but it looks like the dog looks like he likes his bread. So then that's fine because uh, that's showing that she wants it. She's getting benefit from it. Now, what if there's a dog running after her, a wild dog chasing her? And he, he, while during this mad dog chase, she's running down the block. He says, be my wife. With this kikar. Uh, and, uh, and she says, throw it to the dog to distract him. Now, what do we say there? On the one hand, we could say, uh, uh, for the benefit that she receives, that he's saving her life, she says, listen, uh, yes, I'll be Mikudesha to you. She's basically saying, yes, just feed it to the dog so that you can distract them, at least you'll have a wife who's alive, because if this dog kills me, then it won't, have, it won't help you at all. So is this her way of saying yes? Or she can say after, listen, you're on a Doraita level, right? Uh, you had a, you had a uh, obligation to save my life anyway. Um, and therefore, this is no benefit that you gave me. You didn't do me a favor by giving the bread to the dog, right? I was saying, help, right? Give the bread to the dog. I was just saying that help save my life. I wasn't agreeing to marry you. You had to do that anyway. That's the two sides. Fantastic case. Uh, and we continue, continue to debate that case. Last case. A husband, a man says, here, be my wife for this uh, loaf of bread. She says, give it to that poor person. And That's her way of saying no. Even if it's a poor person that relies on her. This poor person comes every day to get some food from her. That's not Mikudeshet. Why? My ta'ama amra ki hechi demechayav na be'ana hachi mechayav be'at. Because she can say to him, just as I, I am obligated to help the poor person, so are you. Just because I regularly help him doesn't make you any less responsible for helping. People think that a lot. Oh, this person is being taken care of already by someone else. I, I'm, I'm exempt. No, everybody has an equal obligation to help that poor person. So when she said, uh, listen, take this bread, give it to the poor person, that's a way of saying, no, I don't want Kiddushin, but if you, you, know, if you, um, you do have an extra, pe- uh, extra loaf of bread, be a good idea. You're obligated. Give it to that poor person. And he can say, um, oh, well, I was feeding him on behalf of you. You were going to feed him. So instead, you get benefit by... Um, uh, by me giving the poor person the bread, she could say, no, that doesn't, doesn't work like that. I, I like to help him. But if you gave him uh, uh, the bread yourself, then you fulfilled your own obligation to help a poor person. Baruch Adonai Amen v'amen.